joining today's NeedyMed special topic webinar, Samaritans, Suicide Prevention. My name is Carla. I am the Director of Education at NeedyMed. And before we get started with today's presentation, I just want to go over a few tips. If you have questions during the presentation, feel free to ask them at any time by typing them into the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Just know that we will reserve answering questions until the end of the webinar. If we do not have the time to answer your specific question, please know we will follow up with you personally via phone or email within about a day. But of course, we will provide you with contact information for both needy meds and Samaritans should you need assistance prior to that. I'll also let you know that this webinar is being recorded and we will convert it into a video to be posted on the NeedyMed YouTube channel. That usually takes a few days, so you, you can expect that to be up by, I would say, the beginning of next week. Also, in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel, you will see a PDF version of today's PowerPoint presentation, just for your review, just for your records, or certainly if you'd like to share it. If you have difficulty downloading that, don't hesitate to shoot me a message or send me an email after the webinar and I'd be happy to resend it to you. So let's get started. For those of you that are not familiar with Needy Meds, there's just a screenshot of, uh, I'm sorry, um, a slide of the Needy Meds mission statement, which is to educate and empower those seeking affordable health care. Essentially, Needy Meds is an informational resource, meaning we do not offer direct financial assistance. Rather, we refer people to programs that do. And we do that by our website, www.needymeds.org, or through our toll-free helpline, which is 1-800-503-6897. Again, don't worry about um, Remembering that information will be provided on a slide at the end as well. So getting back to our mission, as I had said, an important part of that is educating people. And certainly we define educating people by educating them about needy meds and the resources we have to offer. But we also define that portion of our mission, education, by making sure that we educate people about other important resources and topics, which is why we are so pleased to have a representative from Samaritans with us today. For those of you not familiar with Samaritans, their mission is to reduce the incidence of suicide by alleviating despair, isolation, distress, and suicidal feelings. In this webinar, you will learn about risk factors and warning signs for suicide, how to talk to someone who may be suicidal, and basic steps in getting a suicidal person help. Today, Rose Shayette will be walking us through this information. Rose is the Coordinator for Community Education and Outreach with Samaritans, Inc. of Boston. In this position, she teaches suicide prevention workshops to youth, adults, and elders throughout the greater Boston area. Prior to this position, Rose spent two years answering calls and texts on the Samaritan Helpline. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the screen and the mic to our guest panelist, Rose. So please bear with us while we make that transition. You will hear a moment of silence. And Rose, you should be able to take it away. Thanks, everybody, and um, enjoy today's presentation. And don't forget, that you can certainly ask any questions that pop into your mind as Rose is speaking by typing them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll do our best to answer them at the end. Thanks, Rose. Thank you so much, Carla, for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here today uh, speaking about this really important topic. Um, here are some of our objectives for this webinar. And I do want to just put this out there that, you know, we're going to be speaking about suicide and mental illness and depression and some really heavy topics today. And 
it can be difficult. So I want to make sure that people are taking care of themselves. If throughout this webinar you are feeling like this is overwhelming or this is triggering or you just feel like this is too much to handle, please take care of yourself. If that means you have to leave the webinar, you know, take care of yourself. Um, as you can see at the bottom of this page and actually at the bottom of every single slide, I have the Samaritan's 24-hour helpline, which people can call or text. So that number is there. So if you're feeling like this is too much for you, feel free to remove yourself from the webinar and maybe even reach out to us if you need to talk to somebody. And we'll be looking at this topic from the perspective of how might you support others that are at risk for suicide. So it could be a family member, a friend, a colleague, um, really anybody. So that's sort of the the perspective that we'll be taking. Just to share a little bit about my organization, Samaritans, uh, we are located in Boston. So we have a few different programs. The one that we have that's really uh, beneficial for everybody across the country is our 24-hour helpline in which people can call or they can text. This phone number is confidential. It's anonymous. It's free. Uh, when people reach out to us, they don't have to share their name, where they live, their age. You know, they only have to share the information that they're comfortable talking about. And I think sometimes when people hear about, you know, maybe a number like ours or other helplines like this, I think sometimes people think that it's really only for those that are suicidal or maybe it's only for people that are having some sort of crisis. And, I mean, certainly we get calls and texts every single day from people who are suicidal and who are experiencing some type of crisis, but it's actually a very low number uh, represented of those calls and texts that we get. So the overwhelming majority of people that are reaching out to us, they really just need to talk to someone and they're going through a tough time and they need some extra support. So I think it's a really great resource. I really encourage people to, you know, hold on to that number for yourself or just hold on to it to, to pass along to somebody else if you know of somebody who is going through a tough time. And, you know, we have a couple other resources that are really more just uh, local to Boston and the greater Boston area. Like Carla said, I do education and outreach. So I go around and, you know, I speak very openly and honestly with even kids about this topic. And I really do find that no matter the age or the background, people really want to speak about suicide, want to speak about mental illness. They just don't always feel like they have the ways in which they can talk about this openly. So um, I do hope that by the end of this webinar, many of you might feel a little bit more comfortable and a little bit more confident speaking about some of these difficult topics. The last program I'll just mention that we offer uh, locally in Boston and around Boston is our grief support services. And this is specifically for people that we call survivors of suicide. A survivor of suicide is someone who has lost someone to suicide, a family member, a friend, a colleague, really anyone. And, you know, when a person passes away for any reason, obviously the grief is so overwhelming and so painful. With suicide, it's there are some additional complexities to it. There might be a lot of shame. You know, this is such a stigmatized topic, so those survivors might feel a lot of shame in the aftermath. They might feel a lot of guilt. You know, maybe they are thinking, what could I have done or how could I, you know, not have seen this? They might just be really confused. Maybe they saw the person a few days ago, and that person seemed happy and smiling. So we try to offer uh, these meetings for, pe for, for survivors to come together and discuss their grief in uh, a way amongst other survivors, and it's, it's facilitated by someone who is also a survivor of suicide. So basically, throughout all of our programs, we just don't want anyone to feel like they're ever alone. Everything is free, and you know, I think that you know, hopefully we're making a difference, and I think we are. So let's uh, briefly talk about some facts and figures of suicide. So bear with me as I bring all of these statistics up. Okay. So that first one we have up here, 44,000 suicides in 2015, I just want to mention that 
These are the number of suicides that were reported as suicides. The fact of the matter is we don't actually know how many suicides are taking place beyond that because there are a lot of situations where somebody maybe did die by suicide, yet it actually wasn't reported as a suicide. So a couple of examples I can give you is perhaps there was an overdose and it was, in fact, a suicide, yet it wasn't reported as such. Or maybe there was a car accident, maybe in, involving one vehicle, and, in fact, it was a suicide, but not reported as such. So we don't actually know the full, you know, breadth of how many suicides are happening every year. This is what we know is reported. And for all of those um, suicides that do take place, there are over a million attempts of suicide. So these numbers are pretty staggering. Second leading cause of death for youth. The highest rate is, I'm oh, sorry, adults. Oh, oh, my apologies. <laughs> Got ahead of myself. Highest suicide rate in 2015 was adults aged 45 to 64, particularly white males. And I do find this last statistic pretty interesting that men die by suicide at much greater numbers than women do. The women are attempting suicide much more often. So some reasons behind these um, these last two statistics here on the slide are that men tend to use more lethal means like firearms, whereas women might be more inclined to use maybe pills, perhaps cutting. So, you know, the means really do play a role in all of this. And I think just in terms of our culture, men are often told to, you know, quote unquote, man up and, and be strong and don't show vulnerability. Whereas women, it might be a little bit more okay to ask for help and to show that vulnerability. And what I always try to tell men and boys, whoever I'm talking to, I try to help people in general realize that it's not a sign of weakness to ask for help. It's really a sign of strength. And we should be trying to encourage people as much as possible that it's okay to ask for help and that it is a strength at the end of the day. So since I know there's people calling in from probably all over the country right now, I just wanted to show a little bit in terms of the suicide rates across the board. So the darker the color on this map, uh, the higher the number of suicides are. And there's a lot of factors, but a few that probably play in are, first of all, isolation. That can play a really big role if someone feels isolated or they're not really they don't really have access to maybe a hospital or some type of uh, mental health resource or just isolate, social isolation as well. The weather could play into this. And again, I know I mentioned this before, but the access to means, the access to lethal weapons does play a role as well. So if somebody has access to a firearm, they may be at a high risk for suicide if they're suicidal. If there's a fence on a bridge, that's actually a way to potentially prevent suicide. If there's, you know, maybe not, maybe a home that doesn't have a lot of pills around, that's another way that, you know, one could prevent suicide. So having access to these means or not having access to these means at the end of the day can help in preventing suicide. There's a lot of myths about suicide, and I think that this first one we have up here is is really, really a big one that, you know, people in my profession were really constantly trying to help others understand, which is that if, you know, there's, there is this idea that if you talk about suicide, you could somehow place that idea into someone's head. Or if you ask somebody, are you feeling suicidal, and they're not feeling suicidal, that you could suddenly make them think, oh, this is an option for me. That's really not how it works, and they've done study after study to show that this really is just not the case. And, you know, we really find on our helpline when we're speaking to people that when we ask somebody if they're feeling suicidal, a lot of people feel so much relief. And they almost feel like a, a weight has been lifted off of them because maybe nobody was speaking to them or no one was asking them that question, or they didn't know that it was okay to talk about. So it really is okay to talk about this subject. You can't influence someone to, to attempt suicide or be suicidal just by these kinds of conversations. And I wanted to highlight this last myth that I have up here, and I wanted to share with all of you that on our Samaritan's Helpline, we actually have volunteers who are as young as 15 years old answering the phone calls and answering the text messages. So it just really goes to show that you don't have to be a mental health professional 
to truly help somebody who might be suicidal. If you have some sort of tools in your toolbox of how to be, you know, a good listener and be empathetic, those are some tools that can really help someone who is suicidal. But you definitely don't have to be a professional to be able to give somebody assistance. So we're going to sort of talk about a few of these things uh, throughout the, the following slides. But I wanted to just sort of highlight the last bullet point that I have here because there's, you may have noticed throughout the, these last few minutes we've been speaking that I try not to use the word commit. I try not to say commit suicide. And that's usually the language that we hear, but I try not to use it. And the reason is that, you know, when we think about the word commit, commit has a lot of intent behind it and like a, a real thought process behind it. And one of the com complexities to suicide is that it's really not about wanting to end the life. It's about wanting to end the pain. And it's about the pain feeling so overwhelming for somebody that when they're actually in that moment of maybe contemplating suicide, they're so clouded by that pain. Can they really make thoughtful decisions? Can they really make decisions that have true intent behind it, you know, potentially not. So people that work in suicide prevention, we're actually trying to change the language from using commit suicide to saying other things, like maybe a person died by suicide or somebody took their own life or somebody killed themselves. I don't get mad when I hear people using the term commit suicide because frankly speaking, that's all we hear, you know, for the most part when we hear about it in the news or it comes up in conversation, this is the language that we use. But I do believe that language can build to the stigma. So I just try to put that out there to sort of help people realize, you know, that maybe we can make some changes in how this is viewed. And one way we can start is by changing our language. So we're going to speak briefly about what are those things that might actually lead somebody to feeling suicidal. And, you know, this is what we call risk factors. So I have a whole bunch of um, examples of what some risk factors could be. There are probably a lot more that we could think of, but this is sort of just a basic list to work off of. The really important thing that I want to try to help people understand is that risk factors are not causes of suicide. There is not one thing that causes suicide. Usually, it's a bunch of contributing factors, a bunch of these risk factors. I do think that sometimes when we hear about suicide, maybe in the news, sometimes it is framed as being sort of a cause and effect, that maybe there is one thing that causes suicide. So one example I can give you is, you know, sometimes you hear that really, really tragic story in the news where maybe they'll say, a girl was being bullied in school, so she took her own life. And they really make it sound like the bullying 100% caused the suicide. But, you know, whenever I talk to kids, and you know, like I mentioned in the beginning, I talk to kids very openly about these topics. Whenever I talk to kids, I ask them, do you think that everyone who gets bullied is suicidal? And, of course, they say no. That's definitely not the case. So I really want people to try to understand that usually it's never just one thing. It's never just one risk factor. What can happen is sometimes there might, you know, there might be a person who is experiencing a handful of risk factors, and they're getting pretty overwhelming on that person's shoulders. And maybe on top of that, they don't have a lot of support around them, or maybe they do have support, yet they just don't feel supported by anyone. Maybe on top of that, they don't have good, healthy ways to cope, good, healthy ways to deal with those risk factors. and Usually when there is a suicide, there is a mental illness involved. Now, again, that does not mean that a mental illness causes suicide. But if all of those things are piling up, for some people, it might start to feel like this is just too much for me. I don't want to deal with this anymore. I can't deal with this anymore. And they might start to have those feelings of suicide. And sometimes these risk factors are things that maybe are sort of slowly building up from childhood, or maybe it's that there's a bunch of risk factors that take place in a very short amount of time, almost like 
a perfect storm. So there's a lot of scenarios uh, that can take place. But typically, let me go to the next slide, typically when there is somebody who is suicidal, there are warning signs. Now, there aren't always warning signs, but I really want to stress that usually there are. The problem is that we usually don't know what those warning signs are. Or maybe we know what those warning signs are or we sort of have a gut feeling inside. Maybe we feel too nervous or like it's too personal to ask somebody about what's going on with them. I always like to use the analogy of CPR. We all know what the warning signs are if somebody can't breathe or if they're choking. And, you know, we don't necessarily have to be a doctor to be able to save that person or give that person some help. And it's really the same with suicide. You know, maybe we can't save everyone who is choking. You know, we can try to do the harm, like we can do CPR. And with, the, uh, with suicide, maybe we can't prevent every suicide, but if we know what some of those warning signs are, we certainly have a much better chance of being able to help and maybe even save that person's life. So there are so many warning signs. And again, just like with the risk factors, this is sort of a, a list that I've come up with that are ones that, you know, are, are pretty common when it comes to a person being suicidal. So certainly people sometimes make direct statements, you know, what's the point of this? Uh, I'm a burden on people. No one would miss me if I were gone. And to go to the last one on the page, people sometimes even make jokes about suicide out loud. Now, I do think that we sort of as a culture make jokes about suicide all the time. Um, you know, you might hear a student in a school say, oh, I just failed my math test. I'm going to kill myself. Or you, you're talking to a friend and they say, oh, I was stuck in traffic for two hours. I just wanted someone to shoot me. I just wanted to die. You know, we sort of make these very casual jokes about suicide very often within our culture. And I do think that oftentimes it's simply that. It's a joke. We're so frustrated by something. We kind of don't know what else to say besides this very morbid thing. But I do think that sometimes people make jokes about suicide and they're actually not joking. They're trying to figure out, is anybody around me really listening to me? Or is anybody around me really hearing? Does anybody care? So what I really encourage people to do is, you know, if you hear somebody make a joke about suicide or make a joking comment, maybe in an email or on social media, approach that person, send them a message, talk to them face to face, just say to them, you know, I heard that thing that you said earlier, or I saw that thing that you posted on Facebook or in that email, and I'm worried about you, and I want to check in, see, was there anything there? How are you doing? And they might say, are you serious? That was a joke, you know. Are you kidding me? Oh, I'm sorry, I keep clicking. My apologies. They might say, are you kidding me? I was joking, and you might feel kind of embarrassed and kind of, you know, like, ah, why did I even bring that up? But you know what, at least for me, at the end of the day, I would rather know that I checked in with someone that I was worried about than think about it later on and be like, I wonder if they're being serious. I wonder if there is something there. So I just think that it never hurts to check in with people. I've had some experiences myself, um, actually even quite recently, where I saw people write some kind of hopeless things, particularly on Facebook. And a couple of these people that I saw sort of, questionable things written on, on their on their walls one of them I hadn't talked to in 10 years another person I frankly didn't like very much but something about their tone and the writing worried me and I felt like I need to message them I need to see how they're doing and I ended up having some pretty meaningful conversations with both of those people so I just think it never hurts to sort of reach out to people because you never know if that person might be struggling and it might just be so appreciative of that help so, you know, withdrawal is a pretty big one, withdrawing from friends, family, activities, quitting a hobby that that person used to enjoy. Maybe their schoolwork or their uh, work is going down, their performance and work is going down, sleeping a lot, never sleeping, eating a lot, never eating. I, I want to highlight this one here, the sudden mood lift after a down period. What this basically means is, Maybe there's a person who operates at kind of a low level. You know, maybe they're depressed, maybe not, but they always seem kind of down. And then there's a sudden spike, and they seem 
happier. They seem like maybe they're okay. And what I want to mention is that, you know, our initial thought might be this person is doing better. They're getting the help that they need. They're feeling better. This is great. And that could absolutely be the case. But the flip side of it could be that maybe that person has actually figured out a plan. They figured out that if they take their own life, they will be out of this pain and they're sort of feeling better and that's how they're presenting to other people. So that's an important one to keep in mind. So like I said, there's a lot more warning signs and one really challenging thing is that a lot of these things on this list are things that might just happen in life. So giving away belongings, putting one's affairs in order, that can be a very normal thing that people are doing. Changes in weight or appetite, that can just be normal, you know, life things. So it's really hard. The only way we're going to know if one of these warning signs is actually a warning sign for suicide is if we speak directly to that person. Maybe if we say to them, you know, I've noticed that you've had like bags under your eyes lately. You just look really tired. And that's different from what I know about you. What's going on? Are you okay? All of these things are changes in what we know about the person. They're changes in what we usually see in them. And that's just why it's important to be mindful of those changes, not be afraid to sort of face these head on and bring them up with someone. Because again, if it turns out that this person really is suicidal, you could really be helping them out just by acknowledging what you're seeing. But I encourage everyone to do a little bit more research online to see what some other warning signs might be for suicide so that you can be fully educated in this topic so that you can maybe notice them in people around you. And these are just some emotions that somebody might feel if they're feeling suicidal, depressed, out of control, isolated, worthless, overwhelmed. There's a lot of emotions they might be feeling. So we're going to do this just as sort of this little image to help illustrate how sometimes events over time can build up on an individual to the point where they might actually feel like they're drowning. And sometimes we can't see these things that they're dealing with. We might not actually know that this person feels like they're drowning. So in, we have this sort of person here, this stick figure. As you can see on the bottom, this individual is 60 years old. She's a woman. And I'm going to start bringing up some things that she's going through, that she's gone through in her life. So at age 30, her mother passed away. She started a high-stress job at 35. She got a divorce at 40, diagnosed with depression, broke her hip, has become addicted to painkillers, starts actually having thoughts of suicide. And if you can imagine that at all of these junctures in her life, when all of these difficult things were happening, imagine that these are waves. This is water that's just going higher and higher and higher for her. And some of these things could be, you know, related to one another. And maybe some things could have been done to prevent some of these things. You know, we just don't know. And what I want us all to think about in sort of looking at this image is that we might see somebody struggling with something or might hear them talking about something, but we might not be fully aware of their personal story and how much has actually been being filled up on that person's plate. You know, everybody handles situations differently. I think it's important for us to realize that although we may think something might be really small for someone else, that, you know, for them, it might actually be sort of the breaking point. For them, they might actually be feel like they're drowning. And, you know, you might hear somebody say something, you know, maybe someone's complaining to you because um, they just, they need a good night's sleep and they're tired. And to you, maybe it sounds like, Sleep, come on, that's not that big of a deal. But maybe that's the breaking point for that person. And we all handle things differently. So I think at the end of the day, we just, you know, we can't judge people. We shouldn't judge people. The best thing we can do is just to listen and to validate what they're going through. And a big part of this is, you know, taking care of ourselves, building up our protective factors, building up our resiliency. What I do encourage everyone to do, either right now or at the end of this webinar, is just to write down on a piece of paper 
maybe three to five things that you yourself do to cope with stress or difficult things in life. Because it's so important for us to know, you know, what actually helps me and what are those times that I should be utilizing my self-care and utilizing my own coping strategies. Because at the end of the day, if you're taking care of other people in your life, whether it's in your profession, whether it's in your, your life outside of your job, we can't take care of other people if we don't know how to take care of ourselves. So I, whenever I do my workshops face-to-face with people, I love to have people write down what they do and then share some of those ideas out loud because I think that we can always be building up our own resiliency and can always be learning new coping mechanisms from other people. You know, that, that never stops in life. So our, our days can get so busy, but just important to know what are the things that can help me and actually find those times to do those things. One other thing I wanted to mention about coping skills is that I know in my line of work, I've spoken to people before who really express that they don't know how to cope or they say, nothing will help me, nothing will make me better, or they even say to me, tell me what to do. And, you know, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a few slides, but I don't really like telling people what to do. I don't really know if I want to give people advice necessarily or tell them what will help them. But, you know, if you're ever in a situation where someone is asking you, for help or maybe they're expressing that they don't know how to cope with something, what you could say to somebody is, you know, I don't, I know what helps me when I'm going through a tough time, but I don't know what's going to help you. But let's talk about it. I can give you a couple of ideas of things that I know work for other people, but I'm not sure they're going to work for you. You know, some people like to take a walk and get fresh air. Some people like to journal. Some people like to color and coloring books but I'm not sure what's going to help you. So let's, let's brainstorm. Let's talk about it. So if you kind of present it to this person as a, I'm not sure this will help, but let's brainstorm, they might be more willing to listen because nobody likes to be told what to do. But I think that's sort of a nice way to, to do it is to just sort of uh, bring it up casually in a way and, and more of a brainstorming session than a, you should do this. So the last part we're going to be going into is how do you actually talk to somebody? Maybe it's a person and you actually know that they're suicidal, or maybe it's somebody that you've seen or you've heard some warning signs, or perhaps you just have, you know, sometimes we get that gut feeling inside, that feeling in the pit of our stomachs where we just feel worried about someone. So how can we actually help them? So if you're going to be having a, a face-to-face conversation, let's say, with someone right now, you need to actually be listening to them, and you have to actually show that you're listening. So making, uh, excuse me, um, eye contact, maintaining eye contact with that person is so important. Having an open posture. So, you know, if you're facing them, you want to be facing them, but if you're facing them and your arms are crossed, crossing your arms, might send a message to them that you're closed off or might send a message that you don't care or you feel bored even. So I'm not, you know, it's obviously fine to cross your arms, but if you are speaking to somebody who is going through a tough time, I definitely recommend uncrossing your arms and just showing that you are open. And you want to be at their level. If they're sitting, you sit. If they're standing, you stand. You want to put away distractions a phone, a computer, anything else that might be serving as a distraction. I do think that sometimes even having a phone out on a table or on a desk can sometimes send a message that you care more about what might happen in your phone than in that face-to-face conversation. And I don't know about anyone else, but I know that for me, sometimes if my phone is out in front of me, I don't even think about it, but I press the button just to see did someone text me? What time is it? You know, what notifications are going to show up? And I don't even think about that. So I think if you're going to, if you are having a conversation with someone that really warrants you to be truly listening to them, I definitely recommend just putting your phone away, out of sight, out of mind. It can make the conversation a lot better. Doing um, a nodding, so like actually nodding your head can show that you're listening. And if, and you also want to be in a quiet place. If you're in a place that's really loud or distracting, maybe move to somewhere else. If you're speaking to somebody on the phone and you're really trying to show them over the phone that you're listening, 
you know, you want to um, do some verbal nods, which would be something like, mm-hmm, I hear you, tell me more, things like that. If you're totally silent, they might start to think, is this person even there? You know, so you want to do those verbal nods to show that you're still listening. I do think that sometimes, whether you're speaking to somebody face-to-face or over the phone, a little bit of silence can actually be helpful, you know, and and also at the end of the day, we're only human, and sometimes we need to take a moment to sort of think about what am I going to say next and to process our own thoughts. So sometimes just letting there be a little bit of silence in a conversation, it might actually send a message to that person that, they do have the floor or this is their time to talk. You know, not so much silence, but just a little bit can actually go a long way. The last thing I'm going to mention just about the listening is that uh, because we live in the time that we live, so many of us are texting. And sometimes we're actually having sometimes intense conversations over text message. So I do think there are things that can be done to show that you're really listening, even over text message. So one of those might be, you know, paraphrasing, writing back some of the things that you heard. It could be, you know, you don't want to be doing one word or one letter responses. You really want to be doing full sentences and writing back quickly if you can. I just think those are a couple of things that are helpful. Under the the don't column here, some things that you may want to uh, try to avoid doing. We have talking about yourself. So I think that we're when we're talking to people, we often want to bring the conversation back to ourselves. And I think that that's just very, very normal. You know, maybe we hear somebody going through a tough time and we think about our own life and we say, you know, we think to ourselves, I've gone through the same thing or I've been in a similar situation. I should share with that person, you know, that I've been in the same situation or how I got through it. I do think that there is certainly a time and a place to relate to others and to talk about ourselves. But we do it so quickly and so often that for some people who are really struggling or who are are in a crisis, I think it's better to actually kind of pump the brakes on that and not do it so quickly and maybe not even do it at all. You know, if I'm speaking to someone and they're sharing a problem and if I say to them, I totally understand what you're going through, I have been there, you know, some people might feel really comforted by that. They might feel like, I'm not alone, you know, this other person has gone through this. But others might feel like, wow, now this person is talking about themselves, or they might even think, this person doesn't really understand. They don't really know what I'm going through. And they might feel kind of isolated by that. So, you know, again, it's okay to relate to people, but I think that if you're having that urge, sometimes just kind of hold off and maybe keep listening. And maybe there, maybe there will be a time for you to share about yourself but just not as quickly as we tend to. And I think it also goes for giving advice. We are so quick to want to solve people's problems and give people advice. And again, there's a time and a place for advice, but there are definitely negative consequences for giving advice. You know, maybe you give somebody advice and you think it's really good advice, but maybe it's actually not the best thing for them. And if they actually follow through with that advice and there's a, there's a negative outcome, they might come back and put some of that blame onto you. So that can be a pretty negative situation. And I do think a lot of people just want to be able to vent and actually feel so much better by just being able uh, to vent, to get some of those difficult things off of their chest. I think one thing that you could do when it comes to giving advice is you could even ask people permission sometimes. So if you're talking to someone, and, you know, they're sharing whatever problems or or difficulties they're sharing with you, you could ask them, you know, what do you think might help you the most right now? I have one um, idea. I'm not sure if it's going to help you, but I'm willing to share if you're interested. But if you don't want to hear it, if you just want to vent, you know, no hard feelings. Let's keep talking. So I think just being honest and open about that, and maybe they say, actually, I'd love to hear your advice. Or maybe maybe they're like, I just want to be able to vent. But, you know, again, giving advice can be fine, but when you're talking to someone and you're feeling the urge to tell them what to do, pump the brakes a little bit. You never know. If you just keep listening to them, they might actually come up with a solution on their own, and that would probably be a lot more helpful to them and and powerful as well. So along with uh, listening, 
we have the asking questions. And it's really important to try to ask open-ended questions. And these are questions that can't necessarily be answered with a simple yes or no. I think uh, sometimes I've certainly had this situation happen to me where I'm talking to someone who's going through a tough time and they start just rattling off so many problems and so many issues. And as a person listening to that, you can get a little bit bogged down and a little bit sort of almost paralyzed in a way. You know, I don't even know what to say to this person right now. They're dealing with so much. A good question to ask if you're ever in that situation is to say to that person, what feels like the hardest thing for you right now? And by asking that question, maybe they can narrow it down to one thing and really uh, dive into that. You can ask questions like, you know, how did that make you feel? You could ask someone about, you know, what helped you in the past when you were dealing with dealing with these things? Or does anybody else know what you're going through? We sort of have at Samaritans, we try to follow this 80-20 rule, which means that 80% of the time, the person who has reached out to us, the person in crisis, is speaking. And 20% of the time, we as the volunteers are are doing the talking. So, that doesn't always work out, obviously, but we try to follow this rule and, you know, uh, ask questions, make uh, validating comments, reflect on what they say, but really get, try to give them the floor the majority of the time. Sometimes using why questions can come off as being um, – the why questions are tricky. If you ask somebody – you know, why did you do that or why do you think you're feeling this way? You're sort of looking for a definitive answer and maybe that person doesn't know why they're feeling this way or why they did that or whatever the situation is. They also might feel like if they're being asked a why question, maybe they feel like they have to defend themselves. So there are ways to try to avoid using why. It can get a little bit convoluted, I have to admit, but uh, just trying to maybe use other language. And you want to use their words. That just means mirror their language, mirror their words. That can really show that, that you are listening. So if you're speaking to somebody and, you know, you're listening, you're asking questions, you might be in a situation where you're hearing things that sound really helpless or maybe that person just sounds so hopeless or maybe they've actually said some of those verbal warning signs, you know, I'm a burden on people, nobody would miss me if I were gone, or maybe again, you just have that gut feeling, and and it is 100% okay to ask somebody directly, are you feeling suicidal? Again, like I said in the beginning, you're not going to place the idea into their head if they're, if, they, if they're not feeling that way, it's okay to ask this question. And, you know, what you could do as sort of a lead-in is, you know, I actually like to thank people. I like to say to people, thank you so much for opening up to me. I can see how much pain you're in right now. And I want to ask you, are you having thoughts of suicide? And you want to be ready to support them, whether they answer yes or whether they answer no. So this uh, slide sort of goes into a little bit of what we do on our helpline, which is that we try to assess the person's risk level. Where are they at? Are they having the thoughts of suicide or are those thoughts of suicide accompanied by, you know, a full-on plan? And this thing, like all of the information here, you may never ever need to even go through this or do anything with this, but I just like to share sort of like what some tactics might be if you were to do that. And by the way, if you ask somebody, are you feeling suicidal, you don't want to say, oh, I'm so glad you're not. Because first of all, maybe that person's lying. You know, we can't control for that. We might ask someone that question and they tell us no and they actually are feeling suicidal, but, you know, we can't control for that. But if, you, if someone says no and you say, oh, I'm so glad, you know, thank goodness, if they really are feeling that way, chances are they're not going to open up to you at any point going forward. And it really just builds to the stigma of all of it. So if someone says no to you, just keep listening, keep supporting them. Obviously, something's going on with them that made you feel inclined to even broach the topic. So just keep listening. And if someone says yes to that question, what we do is we try to find out, you know, have they thought about how they might take their life? Have, do they have access to those means? Have they thought about when? And that really plays into sort of where they fall on, on their risk level. 
Something else I wanted to mention is something called a safety plan. And um, a lot of clinicians use this. A lot of people use this. We use some of this in our, our helpline. And it's basically a way to work with a person who is suicidal to try to keep them safe. And it pretty much relies on them utilizing their own relationships or their own coping skills. At the end of the day, the sort of thing you're hoping to do is find out from them, what is the one thing that is most important to me and worth living for? So some places, I think some places unfortunately still use this, but some places used to rely on what they called a safety contract. And that was basically like a contract where the suicidal person was saying, I will not kill myself. That was really found to not work. But they have found that, that a safety plan, a plan that's maybe come up with, you know, a clinician and the suicidal person and maybe a family member, sort of like a team effort, that a safety plan like that can actually be really helpful. And a lot of people write these out by hand. There's a, there's a template here at the bottom of this page you can find online. Write it out. Keep it somewhere. Cause, because when someone's actually in a crisis and feeling suicidal, they might not even be able to remember, what are my coping strategies? Who can I turn to? Because they might be so clouded by that pain. So actually having it written out can be pretty helpful for a lot of people. If you are speaking to someone who is suicidal, who's in a crisis, you know, first of all, give yourself permission to be human. It's completely normal to feel anxiety and other challenging feelings. The important thing is that you really do want to present as being calm. And, you know, I know from my own experience that sometimes it's not a calm situation and maybe on the inside you are freaking out and so worried and so fearful. But it's important to just at least show on the outside that you're calm because, you know, you have to believe that that person who is suicidal, their anxiety level, like they're really going through a tough time. If they see that you yourself are getting worked up, it might just make the situation worse. It's important to know that you don't have to be the expert. You don't have to ha have all the answers. There are people around you that will support you and organizations that will support you. I want to mention sort of this third bullet point here, um, and then I'm almost going to wrap up in a second. I talk to so many kids about this, and with a lot of kids, Kids will tell each other secrets about being suicidal, and they'll say, this is a secret, and you can't tell anyone. And, you know, I always tell kids, if someone tells you they're feeling suicidal, that's too big of a secret to hold on your shoulders. That's too big of a secret to keep inside. You have to tell an adult. And they often say, well, if I break my friend's secret, my friend will be mad at me. That will be the end of the friendship. And I always say to them, you know, they might be really furious at you, but at the end of the day, You'd rather have a friend who is alive and mad at you than a friend who is gone. And I say that's the bottom line. And I feel it's the same with, you know, our relationships with our family, with our friends, with our coworkers. At the end of the day, we'd rather, you know, maybe break that person's trust to try to get them help than something happen. So I think that it can be hard to break. It can certainly be really hard to break the trust of someone. But if someone tells you they're feeling suicidal, it's too big of a risk to keep to yourself. It's too much to carry on your own shoulders. If it's a workplace situation, it's important to know what the protocol is. If there isn't a protocol, maybe worth it to try to figure one out so that if the situation were to arise, there isn't sort of a scramble to figure out what to do. Alert family or friends if it's not a workplace situation, counselors, therapists, doctors. If it's an emergency, even calling 911, I mean, that's a really scary thing to call. actually call 911 on someone. But again, if someone's life is clearly in danger, that's too much. And that's the time to really bring in some, you know, the authorities to help. And a lot of police can do what they call a third, um, excuse me, a lot of uh, police can do safety checks where they've been alerted that somebody is at risk of, uh, of, of, um, har of harming themselves. And the police can go and, and do a safety check to see if that person is okay. And just good to look around to see what other local resources you might have where you live. Here's a couple of other resources. I wanted to mention that um, while on our helpline, since we're answered completely by volunteers, we only speak English, but the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline actually has 
many other languages and translators available. So I highly recommend looking into that if there's someone who does not speak English but who really needs some assistance in this way. So the last thing I'm just going to say is that, you know, we all have limitations and we can't prevent every suicide. Um, we only have control over ourselves. But I do think that, you know, if we know what those risk factors are, if we know what those warning signs are, if we feel less fearful about asking somebody directly if they're feeling suicidal, again, we, we may not be able to prevent every suicide, but we have a greater chance of being able to really help that person. So this is a really heavy topic. I know how difficult it can be. I'm going to pass this back to Carla. At the very end, you know, I really do encourage people to, to do their self-care, to take care of yourselves, and um, I'm going to pass it to Carla now, and I think we'll do some questions. Thank you so much, Rose. And I'm actually going to ask you to hang on to that screen. You know why? Because oh. um, I'd like our audience, you have more um, contact information on your last slide. Okay, um, my last up, slide. Yeah. yeah, let's keep that up because um, to the audience that's listening in, my last slide, I was going to ask Rose at the end of webinars, I always ask to transfer back to me, but actually my last slide has similar things, just less information. So let's go ahead and keep this one up. And again, um, there is a PowerPoint PDF in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. And if you have trouble um, downloading it or accessing it, shoot me a message in the questions section or feel free to email me in case you want to keep those numbers and that contact information on hand. So thank you so much, Rose, for sharing your expertise and really making what is, as you said, a very heavy topic, something we, um, making it seem more approachable. You really bring up a lot of questions that lay people such as myself, not experts in this field, um, mm -hmm. really can benefit from. And you do break it down in such a way that makes it seem like a much more approachable subject, which is so important, and give really crucial tips for people that are suffering with this or their loved ones that are to know that um, we can be supportive and the best way in how to do that. Um, okay. So there are a number of questions coming in. One of our audience Great. members, and yeah, and thank you everybody for um, joining us, but also taking the time to provide feedback as well as submit some questions. One of the questions coming in that I want to get right to, because I think a number of people will probably ask this, it's sort of a, um, two different questions really. The first question really is, what is the response? What do you say if the person says there is nothing worth living for? So. You know, my response to that would be to sort of dive into that and just ask questions about that. I mean, it, it, it might sound kind of simple, but even asking someone like, tell me more about that. Tell me, you know, w what is making you feel this way? Um, how long have you been feeling this way? And, you know, I think what happens on our helpline is that we dive in and ask these very hard questions. And at the end of the day, we're hoping that through the listening and through really diving into these hard topics, that person will find even a glimmer of hope that they feel can keep them going, even if it's just for an hour. You know, that's, that's, that's big for us. If we can, someone is very much like, you know, life's not worth living. Okay, let's talk about that. And maybe through the talking about it and through the listening, they might actually feel better and hope maybe even better enough to feel like they can kind of get through this next this next step, this next day, whatever it is. Thank you so much. That's really important. And I know I'm I'm picking up a uh, a theme that, um, as you had said, stress listening more than speaking. So mm -hmm. doing a little bit of a when somebody makes a comment like that maybe knowing that you won't have the right response. You can't possibly have the right response. So instead, do a deeper dive into asking why they feel like that and to get them talking. Does that sound about right? Yeah, it does. And um, the, something else I'll just mention is, and I guess it, it's different for us on the helpline because we are trained, even though we're all you know, people coming from all walks of life, including the teenagers, we do have some training. But sometimes if someone is in a really 
really dark place. Sometimes we even talk to them about death, like very realistically. And sometimes talking about it realistically, even asking a question, which is kind of morbid, but even asking them, who do you think would find your body if you were to take your own life? I mean, that's a really hard question to ask someone, but even asking that question sometimes provides people with some clarity of like, oh my gosh, my my sister would find me. I could never do this to her. And that in itself is one way that we might be able to prevent suicide for that individual. So not another thing I'd throw out there. That's really interesting and helpful, of course. Thank you, Rose. Um, another question, this is sort of the second part of the, of, uh, the first question regarding somebody feeling that there's nothing worth living for. How, mm -hmm. if any, can you help that person to maybe make friends or not isolate? Is there a way to do that? Hmm. Well, and or should you really be taking on the role to try and do that? Yeah, I mean, it's hard because I feel like with a lot of these conversations, you're almost sort of trying to provide, like, first aid for suicide, whereas, like, mm -hmm. with first aid, when it's a physical ailment, you're not, you're probably not doing the long-term care. Um, where, you know, maybe there are some situations where you are very close to someone and you're having these really difficult conversations very often and maybe you're even talking about suicide often. But um, it's hard, you know, because I think a lot of people – their inclination is to isolate and is to not want to make friends and not put themselves out there. And we can't force people, I think, to, to do those things. I think that we can mm -hmm. offer, sort of offer those suggestions. Um, and maybe with some people it is even appropriate to say, like, um, you know, maybe saying to someone, you know, we're different people, but I was going through this difficult time before, and I don't know if it'll help you, but one thing that helped me was getting involved with my local church, or what and helped that's me a great, that's was... That's a great suggestion, Rose, because that goes back to what you had said earlier, which is, um, you know, you really can't sometimes offer the right answer, the right suggestions, but you can say things like that. Like, listen, right. here's some things that helped me. This may not work at all for you, but I'm going to throw out some suggestions. Yeah, and you could even offer to, like, go with that person, you know, and, and all, always mm. practicing it with, like, this might not work. This might be ter a terrible experience, but you know what? Why don't we try? And if the worst that will happen is that, well, maybe we'll have a good laugh about it afterwards, or we'll just be like, wow, never, never going to try that again. You know, just even – looking at it from sort of like lightly, like this might be terrible, but let's try it and I'm going to go with you and, and help you through this. That's, of course, really great advice. Um, we have another audience member asking a, a really great, great question, which probably a lot of people are curious about. You had mentioned hmm. earlier, Rose, that if you ask somebody directly, listen, I have to ask you, have you been feeling suicidal? And they answer no. You cautioned us against say responding with "I'm glad," for myriad reasons. Mm -hmm. They may not they they may not tell you again. They may not open up. They may not be telling the truth. So this audience member is understands um, saying "I'm glad" is not the the right thing. What should you say in mm -hmm. response to that question? So you say, "Are you feeling suicidal?" The person says, "No." You don't want to say "I'm glad." What what's another response that you would suggest? So what I do is if, if I if I ask and they say no, I say thank you for sharing that with me, and then I will ask a question related to what we were previously discussing. So you know, um, oh. and actually I say thank you for sharing that with me, whether somebody answers yes or no, because I am glad I that see. they shared it with me. Yeah. Okay. So asking like thank you for sharing that with me. Um, do you mind telling like let's talk more about you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever we were discussing prior to the suicide question is sort of what I, what I do. Thank you very much. And let's see. You did address this. Um, somebody was asking if someone, um, and you drove this home, I think is really important, that if someone, um, if we ask someone if they're suicidal, that is not putting the idea into their head. It's not, and I'll reiterate that um, that's, you know, it's just not how it works. It's been proven, and a lot of people really do feel relieved when they're asked that question, particularly if they are feeling that way. You know, of course, 
some people get offended by that question. Some people feel like it's too personal. And my thought is if you're so worried about someone that you're feeling like you have to ask that question, you know, push aside the fear that you might offend them. Push aside um, – Oh, I forget what I was going to say. But, yeah, I mean, I think just sort of knowing that it's okay to ask the question and that for many people they will might actually be really glad that you are asking them that. And if somebody gets offended, you know, you could always say, um, you know, I'm. it was not my intention to, to offend you. Like, I'm really sorry about that. I just was hearing some of the things you were sharing and I was feeling kind of worried about you. And I know that you know, when some people go through difficult things in life, they do feel suicidal. So that's why I asked you. You know, you could um, maybe not, not apologize for asking, but apologize for the offense that they took. I don't know if, if that makes sense. but No, it absolutely yeah. does make sense. Um, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to, out of what is no doubt a busy schedule, to learn about this really important and, as Rose says, heavy topic. And of course, Rose, we want to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to share your expertise with the Needy Meds users. So thank you so much for that. Um, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, for thank you. So for um, people that have written in and we haven't responded, of course, we will respond to you via email. We have some people that are just sending in comments, which is wonderful. And as I promised, I will go ahead and share those comments with Rose for some feedback about this presentation and concerns of yours. In the meantime, be sure that you have the contact information on that PowerPoint slide Rose has up written down. And if you would like me to separately email you today's PowerPoint presentation, I'd be happy to do that. With that, thank you so much, everyone. We wish you a, an enjoyable rest of the afternoon and a healthy and ha happy holiday season. Rose, thanks again. Take care. Thanks, Carla. Bye, everyone.